to Watch Your Point Overtime. Uh, we have a trio of my favorite conversationalists, <laughs> Bill King, Charles Blaine, Gary Polland. So, Gary, uh, I'm going to pass the ball to you. What do you want to talk about? We were talking a little bit about that crazy cache of, of uh, African art in which Commissioner Rodney Ellis uh, somehow stored and converted at taxpayer expense into a climate-controlled storage facility and was giving tours of the art. Yes. What do you make of all of this? Uh, and this you actually, people were coming to you at one point saying- I have, inf I have insider information. <laughs> the person who allegedly owned the art made a deal with Rodney. Rodney was gonna get county money to build an African art museum. And, and Rodney is a, a enthusiast. Art aficionado. Well, he loves African art. And he has, if you've been to his home, he has lots of interesting pieces. So that I have was not been to his home. Yeah, well, I actually have, <laughs> believe it or not. He, uh, so that was the story. And so, uh, but there was no inventory. And then out of the thin air at some point, there was someone who filed suit saying, wait a minute, that's my art. And so I'm not sure, I have to, we have to look behind the judgment. I think Holly's looking into this as to where this judgment came from. Because obviously someone never answered. So I think it was probably a default. And now they're trying to sell the art or wants the art to pay off a judgment. And Rodney's nowhere to be seen. But since there was no inventory, there's of course rumors that Rod Rodney had already cherry picked the collection for pieces he really wanted because there's no record of what was there and what wasn't there. So it's all bizarre. I don't know why the county, I mean, I don't know why the DA's office never indicted for this conduct because it was obviously for his own personal interest and what he cared about and what he wanted to do it had nothing to do with the public. So it's, it's, it's just, you just throw your hands up and say, how does this stuff happen and continue to happen in Harris County? We now have a highly secure uh, climate controlled Warehouse. storage facility. Charles, uh, any take on that? <coughs> I, uh, I'm just curious why, because on the listing it says they're selling it as one lot, and I, I'm assuming it's because it's been picked through. <laughs> There's nothing good left in it. Like, <laughs> it's like those bins you go and buy, and you don't know what's in it, and then usually it's a bunch of junk. So I, I, I'm curious about that. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just, it's a very interesting development. Um, and when you saw the picture, it was very reminiscent of when all this broke, and it was just like, wow, this is strange. So I don't know, but I'll be watching to see who bids or who silent bids on it. Of course, you, you don't know who's <laughs> actually right, buying right. it. You could have straw purchase. Purchasers that yeah. they're going to buy for somebody. Yeah, else. there was actually a grand jury investigation of this, and uh, Rodney was chided but no billed mm -hmm. in terms of abusing the public trust and the use of money. Uh, Bill, um, eager to hear what you think about this whole fiasco. So the the state bribery statute is is really got a, a significant flaw in it, uh, which says, or actually not the bribery, the misappropriation statute. It says that you have to get a personal benefit from the misappropriation. And so Rodney's lawyers went in and said this was not a personal benefit. He was doing it to preserve this art. It was going to be donated to the county under some kind of basis. And so this was a way to keep it. But unless you show that personal benefit, you can't make a case for misappropriation. Yeah. I, look, I don't think that's a good law because if I go off and, you know, count city council or commissioner of course approves the money to be spent this and i decide to hell with that i'm going to go vote for, i'm going to go spend it over here it seems like to me that ought to be a problem uh, it it's should it's be totally noted that under the statute it should be noted that uh those good lawyers that lawyering that, that bill was just referring to was paid for by, by the taxpayers exactly. under a rule supported by rodney ellis and others that if uh folks come under uh prosecution uh, while serving in office or investigation or investigation you the taxpayers will refund uh, the expense if they're cleared of the charges well and you know you talked about bulletproof for the attorney general i mean if right. i have never seen more any, anybody more bulletproof than commissioner Ellis and i mean turner because there was a lot of question about things that happened right. our local officials are far more bulletproof than anybody because they don't even get indicted forget getting convicted they don't even get indicted for anything um especially something as blatant and i get it state law doesn't explicitly provide to be indicted for, <coughs> for misappropriation if you don't benefit from it but it is so blatant to be able to just kind of dance on the line like that and walk free is it's just unbelievable well on the issue of of indicting sitting public officials gary has long said that that kim Ogg's critical miscue was if she had the evidence and i believe she has 
enough evidence to get a grand jury indictment against Lena Hidalgo. Why didn't she drop the hammer? Yeah, and she, uh, they, 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 they hesitated. The, the story I got from insiders in the office was, well, some of the prosecutors were concerned that even though there was clearly probable cause, the standard for indictment, that they couldn't, they couldn't make the case. And of course, my response to that was, well, you all take cases every day that you have probable cause, that there may be some question that you can make the case or not. How do you think defense lawyers win cases? That's mm -hmm. how we win. So that didn't seem to me to be a good excuse. And you know, it's interesting if you look at the legal aspects of it, she should have been indicted. And then you go forward and look at what the political implications for it, because I had predicted, I think on this show, that, if, that these people are after Kim Ong, Rodney Ellis, uh, Lena Hidalgo, that if you don't take them down on what you can do, because they're, they, they should be indicted by, based on probable cause, that they're coming for you. And they're, not, and they're gonna take you down. And guess what happened? They took her down in, uh, with alliance with uh, Pravda, also known as the Houston Chronicle. Which, by the way, Bill did a brilliant job during the show of describing the decline of a once good, never great, but a good newspaper. And now it's just, it's just horrendous. That's why circulation's going down. I mean, I actually, actually predicted before the end of the decade, the Chronicle will be gone. And, and by the way, not missed. The cover, the sp by the way, the sports coverage is even terrible because they go to press so late, you can't even get the scores from the night before, which you used to be able to get. Let's e extend on the Chronicle. I mean, uh, look, there's been a lot of good journalism over the years committed there. But it's being overshadowed by, in my mind, and I haven't spoken out, and it's kind of like a, kind of like the Ronald Reagan's old rule, you don't speak ill of other journalists, but it does appear to be calculated and activist, Bill. Yeah, and, and, and frankly, unprofessional. I mean, when I wrote there, and I was writing an opinion piece, right. you know, my pieces were still reviewed by two editors, and I would regularly get back where I'd say, you know, some statistic, where did you get this? Show me where you, your backup for this. You know, I was fact checked. Well, they certainly don't fact check the editorial anymore at all. And they're not doing a very good job of fact checking mm -hmm. the reporting. Now look, there's, there's two or three reporters over there I really like and I think really do a good job. But increasingly they're leaving. We saw Jasper Shearp, which I think was one yeah. of the better reporters, recently left and went to the Tribune. Um, you know, it's just, it's like nothing I've ever seen. It's certainly not like the 10 years I experienced there where, you know, there was just no attempt to have any kind of local input. I mean, when I was there, you had Cohen, went to Bel Air High School, you had David Longworthy, who was a lifelong Houstonian. Yeah, you had all these people that understood and knew Houston's history. They, these people haven't been here for 15 minutes and all of a sudden they know how to reorganize the constable, you know, system. And Harris, they don't, they don't know anything about the controversy of Bill Elliott 30 or 40 years ago. They, they have no idea who Bill Elliott even is. They've got Google. You know? Yeah, I know. That's it's their just, institutional it's knowledge. And, um, <laughs> and I don't know, look, I don't know what the political agenda is, Hirsch, just why they're doing this, but uh, it's obviously not helping the paper. You know, the paper, the, the subscription, you pick it up, it's, it's so thin you can barely, you know, there's hardly any advertising. I don't understand what is the motivation behind taking I really think it was a great newspaper at one time and taking it into the sewer like they're doing well I, I did want to add to, to Bill's comment a couple of things I think it's the I think the woke left is running these papers that's what's going on number one but even worse they the Chronicle editorial board people were at the polls handing out their endorsement list actually happened which is, I find, stupefying. I mean, incredible. I don't take much issue with that. I mean, if their endorsement Never give it happened out. happened before. That's I, true. That's, I mean, that's fine. I get it. But I mean, if they, if they issue endorsements, why wouldn't you want people to have them? I mean, I, I, you know, I get why they're doing it. Because yeah, nobody reads the paper, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, full disclosure, Charles uh, is a contributing writer over there, right? I don't get paid. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I do get fact-checked. <laughs> I don't know what they do for other people, but I get fact-checked. But what I will say is that... Um, I think, I mean, every writer has a bias. In the opinion section, you know where I'm coming from. And I think with you, when you have journalists, they vote, they, they don't contribute to candidates more often than not, but they vote and you should, 
you can tell their bias in their writing and maybe they should be more open about their bias, where they're coming from in their writing because you can read through the lines and see it. There was a, a writer, Tim Carney, he's a conservative writer and he was saying this the other day. He's like, when I write, I come the, from the perspective of, you know, I'm a conservative with three kids, I'm Catholic, this is my perspective that I'm pushing out. And obviously I'm not writing journalism, well, I'm writing opinion, not journalism, but you should still put that out there. We know where a lot of these journalists are coming from. We know the schools they went to, we know the causes they support. You can see their tweets when they're not you know, christening their you know, the primaries they voted in the primaries they voted in so i mean at, at this point is it really worth hiding your perspective if you're not doing a very good job of doing it in well, your writing because what's happened is the paper has blended opinion and and news it used to be it was separate the news tried to be objective stories. like rush limbaugh uh, yeah right he <laughs> i was mean a, you know, yeah he is it but he was, was 100 percent opinion when I, when I was there there was a real distinction there between was. the news section and the opinion section, now it's you know, and, blend and it's together. just now they're just i mean you've got two opinion sections you got competing opinion sections over right. there you know? but one's labeled news but it's not true. so there's no firewall none i don't know i don't know what goes on internally all i'm telling you is the the news stories that i read over there most of them are very very they, they come in with a point of view and they're trying to prove something. And they ignore all evidence to the contrary. I, you and I both talked to Tom Ramsey, and they called Mass Mass Constable, and he gave them a bunch of background. They did not print they a single of word of that, you know. Yeah. Well, and then and, the 24 and the way, stories. Going back, to, going back to the two marriage races I was in, you know, uh, I got criticized in both of them for saying that crime was a rising problem. And, you know, just, you know, you, you, you just, you don't know what the statistics are. Well, of course I know what the statistics are, you know. And, 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 you know, and they just completely ignored that, minimized it, scare tactic and all that, because they had a particular political agenda they wanted and they knew it was a powerful issue. Um, I've never seen them cover anything about the clearance rates. No. I, I mean, you know, the sheriffs are talking about. They could have copied you. Talking about the, talking about consolidating the constables into the sheriff's office. The sheriff's office solved like 5% of rape cases last year. I mean, you know, so we're going to take it away from this community policing and give it to one of the worst organizations in the state when it comes to clearance rates. How does that make any sense? And does the Chronicle ever even bring that up or mention it? Never. Not once have they written anything about clearance rates. That's because they're biased and they, and they have a point of view they want to sell and they don't want to get the facts in the way of that. Uh, one thing that they did get right is that <clears throat> those constables who have been out there uh, for a while, and our Republicans have strong political support. How much of this is related to that, Charles? Do you think trying to trying to diminish even further the political power of those elected Republican officials that still remain in Harris County? Uh, well, I mean, certainly a big part of it. I mean, I don't think that the Democratic constables who spoke because th there there's a little bit of daylight, but there's not much daylight. I mean, even remember when we were talking about. Um, uh, the county def defunding the constables. You had a lot of Democratic constables there side by side with the Republican ones. So I feel like they're all kind of lumped in, but you're right. I think from, at least from the county's perspective, which I think influences the writing about this, there is an attempt or an interest in minimizing or completely eradicating the power of the Republican constables because that's the, other than Commissioner Ramsey, I mean, what else do you have at this point? And, um, and I think that's why, you know, we saw the change uh, and Commissioner Lines, which then harmed Commissioner Cagle, and then they want to restructure. They haven't been secret, secretive about their interest in restructuring the constable lines, most likely to eradicate the Republican co uh, constables. So, yeah, I mean, I definitely think that's a, a broad uh, vision that's pushed by the county and maybe executed by some of these reporters who agree with them. You know, 60,000, is that what I heard that their circulation was now? Mm -hmm. 60,000. It, it, does that count online as well? No, that's just no, the just pay. The pay. That's just the pay. Paid well, I mean, you know, basically, nearly all media outlets are just becoming a website with legacy operations like newsprint and, mm -hmm. for some, you know, degree broadcasts, broadcasts that can be put on online as well. One thing uh, I will give them credit for that I like that they started doing, and this is just the editorial side, is the videos with the endorsements allowing us to see some of the back behind the scenes conversations. I think that was a nice ad, but. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe we should uh, invite some of those folks on here to answer y'all's questions. Won't come. Huh? Yeah. They won't come. Hmm. Jasper used to, but I don't know if they have anybody today who will. Well, the, the, you know, their their editorial manager was was a panelist on on multiple occasions. 
So Pulitzer Prize winning. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's move on to something else. And, uh, you know, we have a depth of knowledge here on the city's finances. And we brought up two issues. Uh, Bill has written and, and said on this show that that one cent of sales tax that Metro gets is $1 billion, $1 billion, and uh, which seems completely unjustifiable given the continuous drop in their ridership. You know, can they get by on $600 million in, in sales tax revenue while we plug some very fundamental holes in, in, in government? You know, whether it's, it's, it's a campaign to get the streets straightened out, uh, whether it's to hire immediately uh, more cops. Uh, I, you know, your thoughts, Bill. So um, it depends on what you want Metro to do. If you want Metro to run a really good bus service, they probably need six or seven hundred million dollars a year to do that. If you want to go build all these, in my opinion, absurd BRT projects, that's three billion dollar expense. That's light rail, right? Well, no, it's the it's what you see on uh, post silver Oak. line. Oh, okay. It's it's actually a bus with a dedicated lane to it. Okay. It's this that you go in and reconstruct the lane so that this bus. It runs does have nice itself. flowers next to it, though. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I um, see that bus on 610 more often, like too many okay. times. Yeah. <laughs> well, so well, he's on it. <laughs> but, yeah. it's, but it's, you know, that that will take a huge amount of money to do it. Matter of fact, I think those projects are probably bankrupt, Metro, if they decide to try to do them. But if you don't do that, and you really concentrate on what I think is the important thing, which is running a really world class bus service for low income help people right. to help them get around town, and, it, and making sure that people that are, have some kind of disability that can't drive a car can get to where they need to go. If that's what we really concentrate on. That's probably a six or seven hundred million dollar problem. So there. that's a reallocation of taxes that people are already paying, right. as opposed to adding to their existing tax burden. How and, much, and on the, average, the has the has the city of Houston's annual budget gone up? Has it been like any, anywhere between four to six percent every year for many years? Um, yeah, it's, it's gone up faster than inflation and population right. for sure. And the revenue has gone up as well. Now, a big chunk of that revenue was the federal money we got in. A big chunk of it was the water rate increases, which I think we needed to do that. I, I frankly wish they would put that on hold at this point in time because I think we've got hey, enough money. Punch, punch, punch I think we've got there. enough money over there right now. Um, but the, the problem is in the general fund. And even in the general fund, the revenues have continued to go up there. Right. Um, but, you know, you've got pay increases, you've got just the normal inflation that goes on. You know, from a, the, the waste, fraud, and abuse moniker that you're all the time, I, I'm not sure how much there is there. There's some amount of money. It's not enough to solve the problem. But when you sort of look at the city structurally, <clears throat> what my opinion was as a former business manager of organizations was that we have too few people at the top too few people at the bottom, and this massive bureaucracy in the mid-level, they're all that. making sixty, seventy, eighty thousand yeah. dollars a year. A lot of money has been spent in that area for, it doesn't appear to me to be a whole lot of value. So, but, uh, it, but I think it's, I think it's going to take some really radical solutions. I'm going to tell you I'm going to go Gary, and then when I hear, hear, hear bureaucratic I'm bloat just, is yeah. what it's I, called. I think we need to get out of the garbage business. I think Privatize? We need to privatize it. Yeah, Save there's a, a bunch there's, of money. There's That's nine hundred thousand households in the city of Houston. About 360 are picked up by the city of Houston, so it's already largely privatized. Mine's great, and it's basically I think we're subsidized. My, my HOA is subsidized. We get twice a week. It's like clockwork, and 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 recycling. And the city the city pays your HOA six dollars a household for that. That they spend about two or three times that amount when they pick up the garbage. Look, the city of Houston cannot compete with waste management, Republic Waste, no. and these people that do no. this for a living all over the United States. That's something we just need to get out of that business. I would save money. And for the viewers, yeah. I'm I live in a a, a middle class neighborhood, Sharpstown, uh, kind of Meyerland adjacent. It's called Brayburn Valley. Uh, we I, I've been there for twenty what is it twenty two years, and the Trash pickup has been like clockwork the whole time. 
Saturdays, Wednesdays, heavy trash on Saturdays, always gone. Uh, recycling, I haven't followed any of the trucks like mm -hmm. some of my colleagues in other stations, and, and they probably need to make sure that those recyclables are actually going where they're supposed to. Uh, that's not a bad idea. I mean, uh, it's better. It's a better idea than assessing this twenty-five dollar trash fee to then not even use it to improve trash service, but to pay for the firefighters. I mean, yeah, it's true. when people are complaining about these services, and at the same time, we need to be looking at privatizing EMS. I know people don't want to hear it, but it, it's many other cities. Fort Worth ha uses their countywide management system. Austin does it. Montgomery County uses most of the cities. In Montgomery County use kind of a, a countywide service. It's more cost efficient. It's probably better service. I think we need to look at things like that, especially before we go to the taxpayers. To that, the, to the bus rapid transit thing, I don't know if it was the Chronicle or um, or the Landing, but one of them reported that they're reducing the service for that for that well, lane from twelve minutes every twelve minutes <laughs> yeah. to have an empty bus, <laughs> and every twenty <laughs> minutes <laughs> having an empty bus. Well, Gary hasn't had a chance changes. to talk, so I just want to go ahead, Bill, real quick. I'm I'm encouraged by some of the initial decisions I'm seeing made at Metro. This is something that should have been a long time ago. What they decided over there on, on Westheimer to repave the entire mm. street instead of the two outside lanes was a great decision. Yeah, but that was stupid. And, and by the way, what I what I've got through the grapevine was the staff had been recommending that the whole time, and the leadership wouldn't let them do it. Mm. Uh, Gary, well, we got a leadership problem at Metro then. That's for sure. And, but, well, but that, but not anymore. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I, I, I like the appointments, but Metro needs to be majorly cleaned up. I mean, you look at the, these double-wide buses going down the street, it's almost like a game. The silver line you can't look at because the tent is too strong, but everywhere else you can see, and there's buses running with two people, and it's a double-wide. Why, why are we doing this? Well, because they got government subsidies to buy these big-ass buses they didn't need. So part of the problem is I think we need to take a step back and look at what the, the needs of what Metro for and Bill articulated it well which is to help people that are, are transportation deficient to have the opportunity to be able to get where they need to go and does the system do that now that's a good question because I hear stories from clients who had Terrible. to take buses to court and they got to change buses three times they got to leave four hours before it, it seems to me and what I would do if I was in charge I'd say why don't we look at creating our own met uh, or uh, lift system Uber or Uber system, system mm -hmm. so people can get where they need to go well, I we, mean, we don't need to create it because we'll never be able to do right, it. Well, then, <laughs> yeah. then, then <laughs> just hire us, <laughs> give people a number that's for City of Houston people yeah. that want to do Uber and just pay for it. I, I think it actually end up being cheaper You'd than what we money. spend on Metro. We get rid of that building downtown. We can get rid of all these buses we don't need. I, I just don't get it. And, and, and it's kind of like, you know, the closest thing to eternal life on Earth, uh, Ronald Reagan used to say, is a, is a government agency. And our government agencies, as articulated here by the panel, they need to be looked at hard for efficiencies, operations, privatization. There's all kinds of things you can look at before you go to the taxpayers and say, hey, we need to raise your taxes. And yeah, five, well, again, if, would a 5% across the board cut diminish the diminished service that we already have? Well, the mayor said on Tuesday or Wednesday that, he, I think it was Wednesday, he said that he doesn't know in any department where a 5% cut could be made without reducing services. That's what he's, and, and I don't know that to be true. I feel like there are some departments that could probably deal with a 5% cut without us recognizing any difference. Maybe not all. I'm sure, I mean, if you take it out of public, uh, uh, public works, I'm sure we're going to feel that, but I'm sure libraries we probably won't feel. Um, and so, or maybe, I don't know, who knows, but I do think that there is room to cut. And on the race front Reese thing, I agree, it's probably just negligible or marginal around the edges, but as a taxpayer, I would feel better if they came to me and said, listen, we tried to look, we found two and a half, five million, something like that. Now we need to ask for the rest. We yeah. tried, we did what we could, and this is all we could find. Um, and and the, the Metro thing, you know, it, it, I know it takes a vote to, to shift that. They need to be talking about Metro about just uh, absorbing some costs, whether that's changing the structure of their police so that they can overlap without formally merging or something so that they can just absorb some of the costs off the city's books. Because I was, city of Oklahoma, they have a one cent sales tax that they re-up every five years. They generate about a billion dollars from, according to the mayor, every year for this. And they use it for purely quality of life things, stadiums, this, that, the other, but that's how they're luring people into the city. They're finding ways to do it. I said city of Oklahoma, Oklahoma City is what I meant. Um, but we need to be doing more stuff like that. And I feel like we're not even, they could turn on those meters downtown and make them run every all night, every night, so that we don't have to pay the parking lots, and they could still make money there too. Responding to something you said sure. earlier, uh, we're not going to privatize EMS for the same reason we haven't gone to uh, defined contribution. 
Union. Because the union. <laughs> <laughs> right? Am I right? <laughs> well, look, I, I think that um, when I talk to we got 30 seconds, Bill. police and fire, there's a lot of them that are coming to an understanding that this system's not, it's not going to be there for their widows or whatever if we don't make some changes for the new people coming in. Look, mm -hmm. I, I strongly disagree with Sylvester that you don't change benefits that are already earned. That's what he did, and that's why the firefighters got mad. But we need to change it for the new people coming in. See you all next week. That was a great conversation. Only three. <laughs> Only three. You could go Still another half by. hour. See you later.